On page 7 of Rebooting AI, Gary Marcus and Ernest Davis give a simple reading comprehension task. Two children, Chloe and Alexander, went for a walk. They both saw a dog and a tree. Alexander also saw a cat and pointed it out to Chloe. She went to pet the cat. At the time of writing, the authors say that the simple questions, did Chloe see the cat and what did Alexander see, would be beyond the latest AI systems. Well, the book was published in 2019, just four years ago, and progress in AI is fast. If we give the same text to ChatGPT today and ask it the question, did Chloe see the cat? ChatGPT correctly answers, yes. And then if we ask, what did Alexander see? Again, ChatGPT answers correctly. Alexander saw a dog, a tree, and a cat. So now AI can do this comprehension task. A simplistic conclusion to draw from this would be that Marcus and Davis have simply been proved wrong within just a few years. After all, we have robots that can backflip, cars that can drive by themselves, amazing AI tools supporting artistic creativity, Far from needing a reboot, AI seems to be doing quite well. But then again... This is not going to work if it doesn't see that it's... Yeah, there's a cone here, it's not... Con yeah, I'm taking over. So that was bad. So even our best AIs today aren't quite there yet. With ChatGPT, one of the simplest examples I know of where it fails is when you ask it the question, what is the third word in the sentence, yesterday was fun? ChatGPT seemingly can't count words and thinks the third word is was. So there is still a gap between the performance of the best AIs today and what we'd want them to be capable of doing if we're going to trust them as being reliable tools. And understanding this gap between aspiration and reality is precisely what rebooting AI is about. Sure, the gap was bigger and more obvious when the book was written, but the gap is still there, and Marcus and Davis would no doubt argue that it is still there for precisely the reasons they outline in the book. They think AI is on the wrong path. So what are their core arguments? Well, at the start of the book, Marcus and Davis set up their characterization of this gap that they call the AI chasm. They identify three different challenges that contribute to this gap. The first of these is what they call the gullibility gap. We humans are so ready to project agency onto machines that we are far too prone to engage with AIs as if we're engaging with a thinking mind, when, so far at least, all AIs are just complex calculating algorithms. They mention a classic early example of this from the 1960s with the ELISA chatbot. By comparison to today, this early chatbot was extremely simple. But still, some of the people who engaged with it felt that it was understanding them and giving them helpful, sympathetic feedback. The second gap is the illusory progress gap, where we are so impressed with AI's improved performance at one task that we assume it implies rapid progress on a more general task. The third and in many ways most important gap is the robustness gap. There's a big difference between making a demo of an AI system that can do an amazing feat occasionally, compared to using a system in the real world where people's lives or livelihoods might be at stake. As Marcus and Davis say, nobody will buy a home robot that carries their grandfather safely into bed four times out of five. Throughout the book though, Marcus and Davis make clear that unlike some people who are AI skeptics, they think that one day it will be possible to build AIs that are indeed trustworthy and reliable at doing the kinds of tasks that we hope to use them for. Driving cars, helping the infirm, accurately summarising large sets of 
complex scientific papers, and so on. They just think that the AI community has taken a wrong step in placing so much emphasis on one approach, deep learning. To explain why, they give a brief history of AI, describing some of the different approaches that have been tried over the decades. A key arc of the historical narrative they lay out is the move from logical symbolic AI to connectionist neural network techniques like deep learning. A majority of early research into AI went down the path of trying to mimic the logical, calculative way that we seem to reason about our decisions. This approach often uses complex semantic networks of knowledge that are explicitly collated to capture how different kinds of things relate to each other. Then, questions can be asked in relation to this knowledge base, and symbol manipulation used to logically calculate useful answers. In basic terms, this approach could be understood as attempting to build AI by mimicking a sort of idealised version of the way that some people think the mind works. The main rival approach in this narrative is the attempt to get to intelligent behaviour by mimicking the way that the brain works at the neural level. Although this idea has actually been about since the very earliest days of computers, for most of the history of AI, this kind of neural network or connectionist approach was less successful and so was quite often sidelined. It was only in the last decade or so that three key things flipped their circumstances. The first was the massive availability of relatively cheap computer power, especially in the form of GPU graphics cards that were originally created for computer games. The second was how the huge growth of the web and business use of computers meant that we were now swimming in an ocean of data that could be used to train the neural networks. The third was some crucial innovations on the neural network algorithms that gave us first deep learning and then transformer networks. And so in the early 2010s, the tables turned and neural network approaches started to completely dominate the field of AI. So now the symbolic, logical approaches are being largely sidelined as old-fashioned dead ends. The reboot that Marcus and Davis are arguing for is to bring back symbolic AI into the mix. And to argue for this, they have to make the case that deep learning cannot close the AI chasm alone. And they highlight three core problems with deep learning and similar techniques. Firstly, deep learning is greedy, requiring huge volumes of data. This can be a problem if the task you're trying to learn simply doesn't have enough data yet, or for which you cannot generate huge buckets of training data, maybe because to do so would be too risky. And even in areas where there are huge volumes of data, such as the hundreds of billions of words used to train ChatGPT, it's not clear that the total volume of all available text will be enough to close the AI chasm. Secondly, Deep learning is opaque. When it works successfully, we usually don't know how it's working. And when it fails, we usually don't know why it failed. This is a real problem if we're going to use this technology for decisions with serious consequences, where we need our tools to be reliable and trustable. Indeed, we also often need important decisions to be explainable, like why did you suggest we sack that particular employee? Thirdly, deep learning is brittle. For example, while vision systems might successfully recognize bananas in scenes most of the time, researchers have found examples of situations where this kind of AI can be tricked into labeling, say, a banana as being a toaster just by adding a well-designed adversarial patch into the scene a patch that doesn't even really look like a toaster. But a problem with all of the specific examples used in the book is that, as we've seen earlier, they can soon get outdated. What I found more convincing and still relevant today was their summation of all of these problems with deep learning as highlighting that it is a behaviourist approach to AI rather than a cognitive approach. What this means is that the deep learning algorithms 
are not building up a sophisticated, explicit conceptual model of the world that they can then use to do accurate, calculative reasoning. And many of their failure modes, like the images of hands with more than five fingers, reveal this lack of any in-depth understanding of what we're asking them to do. Marcus and Davis are essentially arguing that without this kind of conceptual understanding, it will never be possible to cross the AI chasm. They think we need deep understanding rather than deep learning. To work towards this goal, they highlight in the book a number of important insights from the cognitive sciences, fields like psychology, linguistics and philosophy, insights about how the mind works, and they suggest that AI researchers should pay more attention to these. They go on to talk about the way that the old school symbolic approach to AI has made some progress on some of these cognitive tasks, but that that approach also has its own failure modes that are significant. So it seems that neither approach will be able to cross the AI chasm alone. And Marcus and Davis therefore propose that we need to build hybrid systems that try to benefit from the strengths of both the neural network and the symbolic approaches to AI. And they speculate that it might then be possible to apply symbolic safety tools like program verification on such hybrid systems and thereby have high level of confidence in their reliability. This could be extremely useful to help assuage the worries about AI safety, for example. But surely doing that would depend on exactly how the hybrid systems work. And yet, towards the end of the book, I realized that they weren't going to provide any specific novel suggestions for how such hybrid systems could actually be built. Rather, this is a book that simply seeks to encourage more AI researchers and funders to experiment with such hybrid approaches. This could well be sound advice, but it felt a bit underwhelming, given that many people have been trying versions of this for many years. And it's not at all clear to me that adding symbolic AI back into the mix will, by itself, be enough to get systems that truly understand what they're reasoning about. Few would have said that the earlier expert systems understood the meaning of the symbols that they manipulated. Rather, many have speculated that embodiment in the world and independent agency may also be crucial aspects of what is required to truly understand what you're doing. But we're at an extraordinary time in history, where in the next few years, will likely have empirical answers to some of these theoretical questions. Many people have argued that the recent progress of the neural network approach has been so spectacular that scale is all you need to cross the AI chasm. Indeed, just while making this video, GPT-4 was released and yet again, the gap has closed. But despite the apparent progress in AIs, Gary Marcus is still confident in his views, tweeting recently in response to the release of GPT-4. Still stuck at that same wall of truth and reliability, 12 months and a ton of hype later, lots of progress, but same fundamental challenges remain. Time may be to consider that scale might not be all we need. So I think rebooting AI is still relevant and worth a read even if it currently represents a minority or at least less visible viewpoint. And if, say, in five years' time, GPT-whatever is many orders of magnitude larger, using all the data we have, and still failing at some crucial tasks, then Marcus and Davis will have been proved right. And that largely remains my hunch too. We'll find out relatively soon, one way or the other. Whether or not we cross the AI chasm sooner or later or never, the progress AI systems have made to date is astonishing and will already have profound impacts on our society. Change is happening fast, and if we don't discuss and shape the change, it will shape us. So please do subscribe to my channel if you're interested to watch more videos like this. And have you read Rebooting AI? Do you think it's still relevant? Please do leave comments below. I hope this review is useful and thank you for watching.